Today's episode of Bachelor Party is brought to you by State Farm. Like anyone looking for the right partner, you want someone you can count on, someone that's dependable, understanding, someone that'll tell it to you straight, someone who will socially distance with you. When it comes to insurance, State Farm deserves your rose. They're always there when you need them. File a claim day or night with their app, which was awarded Best Insurance Mobile App 2019. Plus, they're great listeners. With 19,000 local agents, they get to know the real you, so they'll help you choose coverage that's personal, not some cookie-cutter policy. So go out and get the one you deserve. Get State Farm. Like a good neighbor, State Farm is there. Get a quote or find an agent at statefarm.com. Welcome to Bachelor Party. I'm Julia Lippman, coming to you live from my bedroom. And I've got with me today my great friend, Rachel Lindsay. Hi, Rachel. Hi, Juliet. I'm coming to you live from my closet. <laughs> <laughs> Will you send us a picture for us to put on our Absolutely. Bachelor Party uh, feed? Okay, great. Are you in Miami? I am in Miami, which is the silver lining, right? Because I'm never yeah. home. So I'm spending quality time with my husband and my dog, but... I'm itching right now from being quarantined. I know. It's pretty weird. Are you uh, keeping up with NFL free agency? I am keeping up with free agency. Thank goodness for that. I mean, we're, we can't watch sports, but we can still talk sports. We can still talk sports. We can still talk batch, too. And I, I just want to know, like last time, I'm going to keep doing this pod. I think you're going to keep doing your pods, too. Yeah. And I hope that you people find it entertaining and a source of companionship and a source of distraction during these extremely, extremely weird times. And thanks for listening. And, um, you know, we're just we're just going to get into it. I, I know it's really weird, but like what else is there to do but to talk about Bachelor Nation? You know, like I said, there's no sports, but we can talk about them and we can start with the Bachelor sport. It is a sport. And Juliet, the people thank you. Let me just speak on behalf of Bachelor Nation because people are craving content right now and you are giving it to them. So they have, they have nothing else to do. And there's right. so many people in Bachelor Nation, they're, we're never short on information to talk about. It's really true. I, and I'm sort of like, I'm not over a lot of stuff. So first of all, I joined TikTok. <laughs> I joined TikTok last <gasps> night. You d- Oh my gosh, you are. I'm- in a quarantine, are you? <laughs> I felt I was driven to it because all these bachelor people are just like posting these dance videos and I love dance videos anyway. And I just felt like I didn't want to be missing any of them. Are you on TikTok? I am absolutely not on TikTok. So We are I, too old for it, you and I. It's not even that. I, I want to circle back with you in 30 days about your okay. TikTok adventures because you're right. It is a lot of dancing. It's a lot of singing. It's a lot of just talking when other people are talking, like just at, at voiceovers. But I don't understand watching the same people do the same dance a hundred times. Oh, I love it. I watched it like, I for like 30 minutes last night. I'm really into it. <laughs> and I'm like, oh, I feel like I get a lot of things that I didn't understand before. But you can't just watch. You have to do. So I'm expecting to see some content, 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 content. There's no way that I'm doing it. Like, sorry. <laughs> we'll do one together. When we when we break oh, yeah. free, we'll do we one do together. A, we can do a duet. Like that's the big high school musical thing. But I, <laughs> for some reason, this crop of girls, this crop of, of Peter's women have driven me to TikTok. That and also Tyler and Hannah being together in Florida. Rachel, yeah. maybe you should hang out with them. They're nearby. I'm good. I'm I'm all about <laughs> social di- <laughs> I'm all about social distancing, which I feel like That people are torn that Tyler and Hannah are hanging out because on one hand, they should be quarantining themselves and social distancing. But on the other hand, people are obsessed with this possible love affair between the two of them. I know. I feel really weird talking about it for a few reasons. First of all, I'm jealous. That's clear. (laughs) That's not what I thought you were starting off with. Okay, fair enough. (laughs) Second, Second of all, I think it's weird to like gossip and hound Tyler when his his mother just passed away. Like that's messed up. And like I think the paparazzi should back off. I mean, I guess I'm not helping by talking about it, but like people don't take pictures. Like just keep it moving. I, I think that's messed up. I think it's messed up too. I know it comes with the territory of being in the public eye, and especially when it's these two together, people want to see what they're doing. But I'm I'm kind of happy that Tyler is surrounding himself with friends. And even if it is Hannah B, I personally think this is just a friendship. That's just my I, take on it. My, that's my personal take as well. However, I have no inside information. I just, I, don't I wish, I wish them both the best. 
I do too. And I think it's sweet she came to hang out with him totally. you know, while he's going through such a tough time. You know, a lot of times when people pass away, you give them the attention when it happens. But then as time goes on, you know, people fade off and they forget about you. So it's nice that he's got a close circ- like group of friends to to take his mind off of things. Totally. I agree. And I think also like, I think what they're doing seems ideal. I mean, just just in general, I mean, I'm I think obviously everyone should social distance, but if you keep it to just a small group of people and you don't interact with anyone else, like I guess it's fine. You're just with each other. I, I don't know that they're doing that. And in in general, I feel that Bachelor Nation, I talked about this on Monday, is not taking social distancing seriously enough. And I know that no. from everyone's Instagram. Well, they've <laughs> been shamed. Like, <laughs> what are yeah and they deserve to be like people stay the f home it's kind of insane but but this, uh, whatever. But this should be like a bachelor nation influencer's dream you get to sit at home and make content you can be self-absorbed and make videos all about yourself and talk to people through your social media accounts i would think that they would flourish during this time that they would enjoy this but no <laughs> i guess but <laughs> you can't like go out I mean, I guess you could go to the beach by yourself and like take a picture with the palm trees. I This is something that I have been thinking a lot about, though, is like how it will affect the kind of bachelor economy. And I just want to reiterate, <laughs> that this, is, this is one of the lowest, if not like bottom 10% concerns of all of the ramifications of this global pandemic. And I, I just want to be clear. I know that. And I'm only talking about it because here we are in quarantine and this is a bachelor podcast. But exactly. there are... There are a lot of ramifications. Like, for example, summer games not happening. Do you think that there were certain people from Peter's season and from Hannah's season, the most recent ones, who were, like, relying on it to keep their notoriety alive so they would be able to kind of, like, continue in the Bachelor economy? Oh, 100%. I don't know who was signed up for summer games. I'm not even sure who they asked. I mean, I don't even know if they'd finished that process. It was kind of up in the air. I would ask people and they would say, oh, I haven't been approached. Mm -hmm. But definitely summer games, definitely Paradise, which we haven't gotten news on yet. So we don't know if they pulled the plug. But you know what I find funny, Juliet? I've been saying that the reason they picked Claire is because they wanted to wipe the slate clean. Yeah. And if you're a biblical person and you think of the story of Noah's Ark, I think... And if that's what Bachelor Nation wanted to do, they're literally washing it away. It's like flooding all this this new wave of people, this this cast out. Because if they can't do Paradise, they can't do Summer Games, probably all the guys that have been on Claire's season, they're going to have to start over completely. It's a new day, you know? That's really interesting. Do you think that they'll do the Bachelorette this season? I don't know how they can do it. I really don't. I don't know either, because, like, if you game it out, like, the CDC said that there should not be gatherings of more than 50 people right. for eight weeks. And they said that a couple of days ago. So that brings you to early to mid-May. And at that point, that is when projection is supposed to wrap, like, two weeks left, essentially. And so the timeline is usually production wraps right before um, or right around Memorial Day. And that's also right. when the season starts, more or less. And I'm not sure they can make it work. And, and, you know, Rob was on the show on Monday and saying, like, kind of like anything's in play and you can move things. They can move anything that they need or whatever. I think I think across all of entertainment, obviously, movies are being delayed. TV shows will be affected as well. So, like, anything is happening. But I don't I don't know if they can do a Bachelorette in 2020. I don't think so. I was reading an article just this morning, The Hollywood Reporter was talking about TV production and it was talking about the loss of jobs and seasons. Seasons that had started will just stop without an ending right. if they air. And then seasons that haven't started will just prepare for the 2021 year. I think we'll jump right to Bachelor. And I think in a weird, twisted way, we'll get the Bachelor we always wanted in Mike Johnson. Because who else are you going to pick? Oh, interesting. Mm-hmm. Interesting. Is that who you think the front runner is if they don't do a season of The Bachelorette? I mean, that was the runner-up after Peter. Right. And I think it's the 25th year. I think they wanted to make a bang, have a like actually have a person of, I shouldn't say person of color because you had Juan Pablo and you had Peter, their ethnicity, but a black person. Yeah, a black person. <laughs> yeah. Just say it that we way. can say it. <laughs> we can say it. A black guy. I mean, that would be that would be really meaningful. That's interesting. Who else is even in the conversation if it's exactly. not Mike? Exactly. I mean, <laughs> it it ain't Blake. No, you know that ship has sailed, Blake. and he it's not Blake. And he's on a rant talking about TV producers, so or Does bachelor he? producers. What's he, what's he been saying? 
He said something. I can't remember what it was on his social media on a story about the producers and how they're evil and they mess with you and they lie to you. Oh, it's all coming back to me as I keep talking. When that's I did the, that's when, great. <laughs> when I that's did how the, you buy time in the podcast world. You just keep talking. It's so true. It'll eventually come to you. When I did the TV segment um, about the bullying, mm. he was like, "Oh, Rachel, that's so great that you did that. Maybe the producers can take their own words instead of lying to you and calling you names behind your back." Oh my god! I'm paraphrasing, but that's the gist of what he said. Wow. So oh, yeah, that's I recall this now too. He was talking about bullying as it related to how his his the way he was portrayed in, in Paradise, which I think was really really complicated. How did you yes. feel about doing that segment? Because you know I talked about it on the show, and no problem telling you how I felt about it. Which is I was, I I was bummed. I was glad that obviously you confronted this huge issue, and I and I think that almost like the racism that plays into it was downplayed, but that's a huge part of the bullying, right? But mm-hmm. I think it sucks that you always have to be the spokesperson about like racism and bullying because you were the only black lead that they've had. Like, does it were are you annoyed? And we've kind of talked about this before, but like, were you annoyed that they asked you to do that, or were you happy to to do it? Um, I think that's a great question. I'm glad you asked me because I've never really addressed where that came from. But, um, so I, it was my idea. They didn't ask me to do it. It was Mm -hmm. more of Sydney, not my idea. Sydney from the season asked me to, I had talked to her because she'd been getting a lot of threats and people were calling her out of her name. And, you know, it was, it was bullying, but it was racism. And so she asked me how I dealt with it. And she said, if she got it, she knows I got it times a hundred. So in talking to her, I realized not everybody handles it the same way that I do. I compartmentalize and move on and put my energy in other things. Not everybody's able to do that. And I understand that. And so it was a wake up call for me that let's stop acting like this doesn't happen and let's do something about it. We need to shock people. People don't understand what's happening in our DMs and private messages. And so I spoke with the Bachelor producers about it. They loved the idea. They spoke with the network and the network you know, accepted it. So I was just happy that they allowed us to have the conversation. I know a lot of people were upset that we didn't say the word race or racism. We said the word bullying in general. But if you look at the context of what the bullying segment was about, it was about racism. So we didn't say the word, but every person who spoke was a person of color. And they talked about what, and we read racist tweets. So uh, you got it. And for me, that was a big moment. It was harder than I thought it was going to be, but I'm proud that we were able to do it. I'm glad to hear it came from you. I think that does make a big difference and nothing. And I don't know if it should, but I guess to me, it makes a difference. Cause I, you know, it's, it's one thing if you're like, this is an issue that I want to address and you tell Warner brother, Warner horizon and you tell ABC versus them like asking you to be the spoke person of that. And I think, I think that is like really useful context to understand that it's something that came from you and, I'm glad you weren't, as my friend, I'm glad you weren't uncomfortable with it in any way. (laughs) I I didn't get uncomfortable until I had to read that hate out loud. And I was even shocked at my own emotion behind it. I will also say that, you know, when you say it sucks that I'm the one that has to be the one to speak on this, you know, it's twofold. It's not because I'm black. It's because I'm also the only one who will step out and speak up. You know, so many people are afraid to rock the boat. Everyone wants to walk the straight line and, and everything be sunshine and blue skies. And so... It sucks when you're the only one who will like speak up about things that aren't right. Totally. Well, I'm glad you did it. I mean, I I was mixed on it, but I think hearing your context obviously makes me way less mixed, particularly if, you know, if you felt it was important and also like help Sydney, who I think she did get bullied. A lot of people are like Sydney lied. I don't think that Sydney lied personally. I mean, I don't have enough information. I, I don't know. But like, also, it's not the same to like be photographed in your yearbook and as like getting superlative as like also having to eat lunch alone. Like, I don't know. I've I've been on Sydney's side of this one the entire time. Yeah, a lot of people came down on me actually and said, how could right. you defend Sydney? And it's like bullying is bullying, you know? Seriously. It doesn't make it acceptable just because you didn't like the way someone behaved on this season. I- what? Totally. I, I think that people also use the term bullying a little bit too oh, loosely. Oh my God. Don't get me started. But also the way you feel is the way you feel. So if Sydney felt bullied, I mean, like who's to say she wasn't? I mean, 
you know, it's a, it's a fine line, but I, I just think that like, I don't know why everyone was like, oh, there's yearbook pictures. So there's proof that she was lying. I never really understood that. Well, yeah. Cause she could have been bullied in freshman and sophomore year. And then in yeah. junior year, things turned around, but something you said, Juliet, which will totally bring it back to the finale. Cause I know you're not over it and what happens. <laughs> I think I think you can look I at it. Talk about it. <laughs> you can look at this from the finale from so many different angles. Just, just the last 15 minutes. That's really all we need of the show. But, um, No, I, crazy enough, I had a moment where I, you know, talked about bullying and I addressed it and I became emotional and I got a lot of good feedback from that. Fast forward to the week of the finale and I do my podcast and I give my take on it, which is what we do on podcasts, right? You get favorable and unfavorable opinions. You know, it's take it how you want to. It's commentary. Yes. Now I'm a bully. Did you know that? So speak about, talk about using the word in the wrong way and how it's lost its impact and it's watered down. People have called me a bully for my take on Madison. And which it's, is that she was not, that she was the She went there for the right reasons. Yeah. yeah. She was, and she was more interested in, in the subsequent fame. Right. And isn't that, you give that title to somebody every season yeah, and I gave that title to Madison, but now all of a sudden I'm a bully and I'm mean and I don't uplift women and I'm a hypocrite. And I'm just like, geez, you guys, you have to understand what a podcast is. You also have to understand that I really don't care that much. I'm just <laughs> doing a podcast. I know. <laughs> I know. Every time I say something to, like less than positive about Hannah Brown, people come after me. And oh, like, my right, gosh. Whatever. Whatever. Let's talk about the finale. So you were there for the finale, right? I was Part there. Two? Yes. I was there the entire time I was asking. We had lunch that day. That's how I know did. you were there. <laughs> and I, I wanted to, be, yes, we did. I wanted to be in the audience, but they didn't mm-hmm. have me in the audience. They had me backstage in like a little area, which was great. So we could take notes. I was sitting next to Neil Lane, who's a hoot. Oh my and, God. <laughs> yeah, he's he was a lot. So, so I, I watched with Christina, him. your pal, who you connected yes! with. Yes! And she noted that the ring that Hannah Ann got looked similar to yours. I can't even talk about it. I <laughs> scolded Neil Lane. I said, as in the backstage, I kept saying, does anybody want a close-up of what Hannah Ann's ring look like? I've got it right here on my finger. Oh, my God. And, that's hilarious. <laughs> and then <laughs> Neil, was, Neil was like, Rachel, I'm running. He was like, it's, you know, I do this every season. I have to have multiple rings. I can't, I can't help what they choose. There are only so many designs. That's and so he kept funny. saying it was different. It was exactly to a T, my ring, even the hidden halo underneath the stone. Neil, this is something I haven't thought about, but I'm really glad you brought up Neil Lane. Is it possible that Peter, despite the fact that he clearly was not over Madison and did not want to marry Hannah Ann, is it possible that he proposed because they couldn't have gotten two Bachelor seasons in a row without a Neil Lane moment? Is that possible? Well, I is it possible that they, they were... made him propose to get Neil Lane on TV? Oh, no, I don't think so. But I, I mean, I think we all can agree that it's easy to sway Peter's opinion. Yeah, agree. <laughs> I think we can all, we saw it all season. I, I think Peter isn't that, indec- he is indecisive, but it became even more that way when producers are kind of saying, hey, you should do this, but then he's conflicted because he's feeling another way. Yeah. Whereas other leads aren't like that. When you were in the room, what was the reaction to Barb like? Were people more <gasps> team Barb or team Madison? People? And by in the room, I mean like in the studio. People didn't know what to say. I mean, that is was not planned. I can't reiterate that enough. If you if you thought it was, it was not. Barb was not a prop. They didn't pay Barb. She's not an actress. I mean, there were gasps when it happened. I screamed out when she said, at first when she started talking, I go, wow, I knew that she had that information because I had talked to her earlier that day. But I did not know she was going to say it on live TV. So when she said it, I was like, okay, good for you, Barb. You felt the need to defend yourself. Great. And you mean the part about Madison saying she wouldn't accept a proposal and that she had been three hours late, right? Right. And I understood where she was coming from. That was okay. But then she kept going. And then she kept, and then she asked, she, you know, asked her husband to join in and defend her. (laughs) I I loved it. People were, had their mouths open. There were gas. People were shocked. They were clenching their grabbing their chest. I, I, I'd never seen anything like it before. What was uh, Peter's vibe afterwards? Like, uh, like when they got off stage? So I didn't see Peter, but I do know that we couldn't start our podcast because there was just a lot of... Madison was upset. 
Peter was upset. Barb and Pete Sr. were out. Barb was probably like drinking a glass of wine, oh hang, God. making an v- Instagram video with her girls. <laughs> like she oh my was, God. She felt nothing. She's a character. <laughs> She's seriously a character. Yeah, she felt um, nothing. I know you interviewed Hannah Ann right after. Was it like mm-hmm. that night? Yeah, it was that night, and we were also supposed to interview Peter. Oh, really? Yeah. I mean, we had a full outline ready to go, and Peter, there was so much like turmoil between Madison and himself that he was like, I'm not in a good space to do it. Oh, my God. I don't. They that's, didn't even stay together that night. Oh, my God. That's really rough. They were clearly never going to stay together. I mean, they had no chemistry on stage at all, like at all at all. And you know what? That's what's upsetting to me is that because Barb showed out those last 15 minutes of the show, nobody focused on anything else that happened. I know. Nobody she, she was stole upset. the show. Yeah. Nobody was upset with Peter that he dumped. He got engaged to Hannah Ann, then dumped her, then went after Madison. Nobody talked about the fact that they didn't have any chemistry. Nobody talked about the fact that they didn't even define their relationship. People kept saying they're together. I'm like, they never said that. <laughs> <laughs> they I know they didn't need to say they weren't together because when Chris Harrison was like, are you going to give it a shot? Neither said yes. Like, yeah, it was never in question. It was it was so bizarre. Oh, my God. I feel sorry. Also, Peter's like on TMZ. There's now forever a, a, a him, I think, the Thursday or Friday afterwards. So one week ago, TMZ caught him leaving the gym asking what they thought, what he thought about coronavirus. And he was like, I think it's really being overblown. And it was kind of, it was, <laughs> it was before shit really hit the fan, but it was after the NBA postponed the season. Like there was enough information and Peter was like, eh, it's overblown. And I think that's more embarrassing than anything his mom did. So it, I, I'm sure I'm, he's changed his tune per his Instagram. He's now social distancing. So it's fine. But like, also this is probably, I, I don't want to say this is good because it's not good for anyone. But I think Peter probably needed to go into hibernation and not like go on the usual post show publicity tour. So at least that's positive for him. Yeah. Well, they were never going to do, and I don't know if you know this, they were never going to do publicity. Oh my goodness. I was told two weeks before that they were not doing publicity. Wow. So, and then we, what we also didn't know is, and if they, by chance, they might do LA. But because they didn't know how it was going to end, and neither did Peter, you know, that's what they kept saying. They didn't know if it was going to be Peter by himself or Peter with somebody. Right. So they were never going to GMA. Oh, my goodness. It's a good time to live with your parents because it's like everyone should be home, you know? You're on the people that you you care about. (laughs) Um, Rachel, what else are you watching now that this Bachelor season is over? And I just, sorry, I'll let you answer, but I'm going to interrupt my own question. I just want to note that, like, we had been gearing up for... 10 to 11 consecutive months of Bachelor. We were talk- I had talked about it previously. It was going to go Peter season, four weeks off, music of your heart, in- straight into uh, Bachelorette, into Summer mm-hmm. Games, into Paradise, into the senior show. And that was going to take us to like November. And now it's all thrown for a loop. So uh, th- actually, I'm going to be spending a lot of time on this pod talking about other reality TV. So I want to hear what you're watching. And we're going to cover a lot of shows. I also posted our Facebook group what you want us to cover because I'm open for suggestions. Obviously, I watch all of Bravo. I can't wait for the Real Housewives of New York to come back. Oh I know that gosh. you're a fan as well. Yes. And, you know, let me know you're watching so we can all watch together. What else are you watching? <laughs> well, first of all, I feel like God is not a fan of The Bachelor. He was like, you know what? That's enough. Dude, not in 2020. Enough. We're not We're not doing all these shows. Absolutely not. Let's just Let's stick reset. to what we do, what we do well. <laughs> <laughs> it's so, um, it's, yeah, it's. There's a lot of really metaphorical and biblical ways you can interpret what's going on right now. And I also feel it's so hard to process and understand what's happening in the world right now. It's like so, so troubling and confusing that it's it's useful to think of it in any framework you can. So anyway, that was my, that's a, a side note. Rachel, what else are you watching <laughs> these days? Well, I'm always watching all things Bravo. Not all things. I'm not a fan of like Below Deck or Summer House. Haven't gotten into those. I'm not a Summer House fan, but you are really missing out with Blow Deck. That's just a huge mistake I by can't. you. I can't. I know people are such fans of it. I just can't get into it. So I'm Vanderpump Rules. Duh. Love Vanderpump. Duh. And all of the housewives. It doesn't matter what city. So what do we have right now? Atlanta, Jersey. Yeah. yeah. We're in the middle of the reunion of Jersey right now. So we've got Beverly Hills is coming up. I think I saw, was it Beverly Hills? Yeah. April 15th. I just saw them announce that. 
I know. I think Kyle was posting about it on her Instagram. And mm-hmm. I go to um, Italy this season. So it'll be kind of eerie to watch that happen. But Jacoby and mm-hmm. I, who you know, it, you, yes. we talk about Vanderpump and we'll get him back during this time. I promise people we'll do it. We'll do like a full Jacoby week or something. Maybe <laughs> next week. Who, who knows what is in store? But what did you think of Jackson Brittany's wedding, which aired last night? Okay, so I thought it was, it looked like a lot of fun and I thought the castle was beautiful. I'll admit, when I saw pictures, I was kind of like, meh, it it looks okay. I thought the episode was super meh. I was just like, we've had 10 weeks, maybe more, building up to this. And I'm just like, eh, okay. I I saw all this on social media already. I don't know. I was just like, this is, they usually do a wedding better on, on Vanderpump. And I was like, this is kind of a miss to me. I think also that's just a sign of the times with Vanderpump. Don't yeah. you feel like it's it's over? I still love them. And I feel like I'm like hanging out with my friends and like I'm curious like what they're all up to right now. But I, I do think that there's like a there's a little bit of magic missing this season. I, it it's is. Just, it's also just because like their fame is so undeniable. So like Lance Bass officiating is like just ridiculous. And like Jackson Brittany be like, this costs a hundred thousand dollars. I don't believe you for a second. Like all that alcohol is sponsored. I don't know. The the main source of entertainment is the Toms. But like the other thing that's hard is like a lot of these people just shouldn't be on TV. Like it's obviously like obviously Max is like probably just, you know, they should have vetted him better. But like, Oh my Ariana, God. Yeah. He's awful. <laughs> yeah. And like, but like Ariana has like significant issues and like she shouldn't be going to Lisa for like, what should I do about my depression? She should be going to therapy and like probably not on TV. So like, it's not that fun to watch their struggles anymore because their struggles are so real. It's yes. not like their apartments are filthy, which used to be funny. Right. And I think that's the thing, too, is when you think about what you loved so much about Vanderpump Rules, it was that they were always wasted and that it was such a shit show. You never knew what you were going to get. And I hate to say this. It's like, but I miss I love that everybody's happy and they're moving on and they're getting settled. But I miss Stassi going crazy on people. I miss Jax being you know, a womanizer. I miss Sheena being irate and always jumping from relationship to relationship and thinking she's in love when really the partner does not reciprocate those feelings. I I miss Kristen going off on people. I miss James. Lala sober, for goodness sakes. This isn't the show we signed up for originally. (laughs) I know. Although I do love sober Lala. I feel like sober Lala is the most rational person I've ever encountered in life. Like just full stop. She's got a lot of good points. I'm also really happy Randall's on the show. He was a huge addition to the wedding. Huge. <laughs> you think so? <laughs> I'm just glad he was there. And I'm happy for Jax that someone else is over 40 in their group. But I, it was like exciting to see the wedding, but it was just weird because I was like, I've seen all of this. I followed it breathlessly on social media and they should have had a phone embargo. I'm sorry. So I can give you like the other perspective. I only saw pictures. I didn't see a lot of the details. Mm. So for me, it was new. It was really sweet to see Jax get emotional. Yeah. I will say this is really dark. I am not attracted to Jax. I thought he looked great. He looked like old Jax. Jax used to be really attractive. I I didn't know what his... his, Okay, never mind. I'm not going to say it because it just sounds bad. What? (laughs) Now you you have to say it. What is it? What is it? Well, when Jax got emotional, my thought was... Because Britney didn't. And you would have thought Britney would have been the one. She was just really happy. And I do understand that. You never know what your emotions are going to be. But I yeah. thought Jack's emotions wasn't because he was crying because Britney was coming down. It was more of the fact that his father wasn't there to be with yeah. him on this day. And he had his father, you know, he, had, he brought his father, which I thought was really sweet, with him uh, to stand up there with him. I think a lot of this stuff is like, I think it can be both. Like, I think Jax can be, you know, emotional about Britney and also like just what the day means. I don't know. I'm not married, but I just feel like your family definitely plays into it. So if there's like a notable absence and like him not having yeah. his, his mom there and his whole thing with his mom really bums me out. But like, I'm just so close with my family that I, I can't imagine like those deep feuds. Like, so they, they make me really sad. I'm like, Peter, I'm really close with my family. Peter's giving me the confidence to say I'm really close with my family and family is important. Just kidding. <laughs> I think that was always obvious. <laughs> no, yeah, there's nothing wrong with it. Your family just can't run your life, Peter. <laughs> That's uh, no. the problem. Seriously, I feel like I need to watch Jackson Brittany's wedding a second time. In fact, I'm going to. Yeah. But I was like, it was like an extended episode. And I was like, do we really need all of this? But I guess it's a big deal. And people do love Jackson Brittany. It's interesting, though. I do think that there's just a challenge for the show going forward. Because like the new people, I like Danica the most, but they're just kind of like, they, I'm just See? sort of like, I don't, 
I don't know. I don't even know who Danica is. That tells you yeah. right there. That that lets you know. I know there's some new people. I know Max, and there's the, the blonde girl who has Dana. N- yeah, Dana. She's there's dead. like no personality. Yeah. Yeah. She's, she's, she's <laughs> kind of boring. I like her. She's just sort of boring. I'm like, okay, cool. Dana. Yeah. She's not carry, good TV. Carry on with your life. It's all good. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know. I'm in, I'm gonna watch a second time and. You know, Jacoby and I will keep talking about it. Can't abandon my friends at Sir and Tom Tom, obviously. But well, can I just say, did you see the previews of what's coming up? Now that preview had me sucked in. I thought, okay, and now we're back. We are back to what we know. The whole thing. Everybody was crying. Whatever this party is that's coming up. Oh, yeah, they cry over. And everybody is crying. And you're like, well, why would Katie be crying? Okay, I get Kristen. What's wrong with Stassi? What's wrong with Jack saying that he thinks he rushed? I don't care if that's staged or not. It was great content. Jack saying, it's like, that's, that's, and and Kristen ending and saying, Jason is gone. Jax is back. Jax is back. Yes. That was, that was really good. (laughs) <laughs> also, Jax is like legit fighting with Tom. So I'm like looking forward to that too. Like, I'm like, tell me more about that. Let's do Again? it. Again? Are I you in real that, time? Or are you on the show? No, I mean on the show. Like I think okay. last summer after the wedding, he like blocked a bunch of them, if I recall correctly. Oh gosh. Jax. I don't know how they're all still friends. I really don't. I don't know either. It's honestly a miracle. Um, <laughs> Rachel, thank you so much for doing this with me today. I, will you do it again sometime soon as we live out our quarantine? Of course. I'd love to, to pencil you in, Juliet, and with all the other things that I'm doing right now. As, as <laughs> what else are you doing? Distance. Are you like exercising? Do you leave the house? Like, what's your deal? I will say Miami is not a bad place to be quarantined. I'm right by the water on the bay, really not nice. the ocean. So I, I take walks with my dog. I work out. I read a lot. I catch up on sports. I mean, there are things to do, but I'm also a person who has to keep moving around or I get bored. So I'm just, right. Yeah. Are you driving Brian crazy? No, no. Okay, great. We just, great. we have to have our time. He actually goes into the office, which is just the next building over. Oh my so God. So it's All like, right, well, Brian, be safe. That's all I'll say. <laughs> yeah. He's, just to do work and stuff or probably to get away from me. I don't know. <laughs> all right. Well, Rachel, stay inside, stay safe. Thank you so much. And I'll, I'll definitely text you soon and you'll come back on the pod soon too. Absolutely. Thanks for having me. AKA Bye. saving me. Bye. All right, we are now going to bring on my colleague, Kevin Clark, from the Ringer NFL show and Ringer staff writer to talk about my current favorite show, Formula One, Drive to Survive. But first, let's talk about today's sponsors. I need to tell you about a brand new book titled You Are Not Alone. It's a novel of psychological suspense by best-selling author pair behind the instant New York Times bestsellers, The Wife Between Us and An Anonymous Girl, Greer Hendricks and Sarah Pekinen. It's the perfect read if you need an escape and can't get enough of the drama on The Bachelor. Shay Miller wants to belong, but her life is increasingly lonely until she meets the Moore sisters. Cassandra and Jane live a life of glamorous perfection and always get what they desire. When they invite Shay into their circle, everything seems to get better. Shay would die for them to like her. She might have to. You Are Not Alone has been named one of the most anticipated books of the year by Newsweek, Pop Sugar, and many other outlets, and has also been included on Marie Claire's Best Fiction by Women in 2020 list. People Magazine says Hendricks and Pekinen are at the top of their game. You Are Not Alone is on sale now wherever books are sold. Make You Are Not Alone your next read. I know you've got time. Available now wherever books are sold. All right, and now let's talk to Kevin. And now we are talking about my favorite show of the moment. Season two is even better than season one. I have my colleague Kevin Clark here to discuss Formula One Drive to Survive, the show on Netflix. Kevin, hello. Hi, Julia. I'm honored to make my debut here. I did not. If you had told me I'd be on this show at some point, I would have racked my brain to figure out why. But I'm, I'm very, very glad to be here. In fact, I texted you. And by text, I mean Slack. I slacked you to ask if you would come on Bachelor Party to talk about the show. And you were like, yeah, but why would I do it on Bachelor Party? Right. So that's where we're at. And the reason is because I love reality TV. I love a good docuseries. And I genuinely love Netflix Unscripted. I've mentioned this a few times. My friend Talia recommended this Formula One show to me, knowing nothing about Formula One whatsoever. And now I'm just completely obsessed with it. And 
I think, let me know how you feel about this, but I think that I know that it's like not really the cool pick, but I think no matter what, I'm just with Red Bull Racing and Jerry Ginger Spice Hallowell. So did you know that Ginger Spice was going to be in this show? I did not. And let me just say, so hold on. Let me just back up for one second. For this show, Formula One Drive to Survive, is there's two seasons and it's one year behind, but it follows right. the Formula One season from the first race to the last race. And each episode chronicles a different race, not always in order, which I think is actually a really smart choice. Right. Um, of a different uh driver, a different team, and you really get exposed to all of the drama of the sport, both from personnel, from making the cars to the actual races and right. it's a great reality show. <laughs> right. It's it's really well put together and I think that the more I think about this, the more that Formula 1 is the perfect sport for this. It's international. It's always in nice places and nice weather and so like okay. it's they are in Australia for the first race of the year in March when it's really nice there. They are in Europe in the summer. They're in England and Germany and all these nice places. They have a race every May in Monaco. Like they understand how to create good television. And so the fact that they're always together, the fact that they're all rich and the fact that there's these huge egos, like it is the more I think about it, the more I'm amazed that it took this long to come up with a reality show about it because it is absolutely perfect. Everybody by nature in Formula One is like fairly presentable. They're all in really good fairly? shape. Fairly? Okay. Kevin, stop. Let me stop okay. you right there. Okay. My top question about Formula One, how do they ensure that every single person is handsome? Like seriously, all of them. Huh, okay. Well, uh, there's a couple of things. I think that a lot of times that uh, there are probably like sponsorship decisions made like once. Mm. So basically, essentially, there's probably like, I don't know, 50 to 60 drivers who could conceivably be Formula One drivers. But then they rise up the ranks or whatever. And and I do think that these they're probably the 10 best drivers in Formula One are probably the 10 best drivers in the world. But then you kind of get okay, this guy, you know, this sponsor might like him or whatever, and they rise up the ranks a little faster. There might be some, uh, just some bias in the selection process there. But also, it's just like a bunch of 25-year-old, like, Hot guys. English, English and German and French dudes who, like, come from, they all come from money with the exception of about three of them. Like, they all sort of have teams around them to make sure that they look good. Like, these guys are really good drivers, but the the, the teams around them sort of understand marketing. So do they have groomers? Like, is that part of it? I don't know. I mean, they're all in sort of the fashion world and like they're all they're all at like, you know, Milan and Paris Fashion Week and stuff like that. So they definitely have stylists. And they're also you have to remember, Juliet, is they're all sponsored by like Tag Heuer, right? Or like right. Rolex or like <laughs> um, they're not. These is not sponsored by by Target here. OK, like all of their sponsors, because Formula One is geared towards rich people, is they're all sponsored by some of the best quite frankly, brands of the world. And so those people then put them in good clothes and good watches and good shoes and good suits and in good places and good vacations. Like it is marketed to look good. And so, right. So you're getting at a couple of important things that I guess I should explain because I'm just going to assume the bachelor party audience is not that familiar with how Formula One works, but there's 10 races, correct? No, there's 21 races and basically every country has one race. Uh, France and Monaco are different races because they're technically different, what, principalities or whatever the hell you call them, but mostly it's one race per country. And the way that works is each team is trying to win the world championship by accumulating points and where you finish in each race, you get a certain number of points. And basically there's like the top three teams that are just acknowledged, which are Mercedes, Ferrari and, and Red Bull racing. And then after, and then Red, and then Red Bull has two teams, which I'll ask you about later. And then (laughs) And Tor- then, Toro Rosso is the other one. Is, is Tor- yeah, there's Red Bull Racing and Toro Rosso. They've rebranded which is like, this year, but okay. Yes. Oh, really? Yeah, Interesting. Yes, yeah. And then there's like the middle of the pack, which mm-hmm. is so funny to me that like people, the like, teams like will be happy being number one and best of the rest, as they say. And then there's yeah. like the back of the pack. And so it's it's the thing that's so fascinating is like I didn't realize. I think as an American, this didn't sink in for me that Formula One is like tennis and polo, the sport of rich people. And it is like, it is an ultra luxury exercise that attracts really rich people to be involved in it. You have to be really rich. 
every person who's like the principal of a team, like AKA GM in American mm-hmm. parlance mm-hmm. is also super fancy and like European. Yeah. And all of these teams are based in like these amazing facilities in the countryside in of, Oxford. of England. In, Oxford. in England. Yeah. yeah. In Oxford. So including Christian Horner, who is married to the aforementioned scary, uh, excuse me, Ginger Spice. Ginger Spice. Gin, yeah, Jerry. So so yes. in season two, Ginger, she has a big entrance. In season one, you see some celebrities like you see. And in season two as well, you see Tom Brady in a shot. You see Matthew yeah. McConaughey in a shot. You see Chris Jenner because the Kardashians are very good friends with the world's best racer and maybe of all time, Lewis Hamilton. Mm-hmm. Um But then in season two, there's an episode focused on Red Bull racing, which I really enjoyed. It introduced me to one of my new favorite drivers, Alex Albon. (laughs) And wait, he's your new he's your new favorite. How did that happen? I just like he has a great story. So he he took up just everybody knows he took over midway through last season. He's the least accomplished Red Bull (laughs) driver. Max Verstappen, his partner, is like really good. And so what you just did, and, and, and not to say that this is a bad thing, but what you just did was say, like, it's the equivalent of being like, my favorite basketball player is Terrence Ross. Yes, correct. Okay. Um, it's kind of like being my favorite Brooklyn net is Karis right. Levert when, when right. Kevin Durant is also You know what's strange? Is, that was the first name that, that popped into my head before I went Terrence Ross there was Karis Levert. <laughs> Amazing. That's, re- <laughs> that's really funny. So yeah, there, it's just sort of like watching the real housewives, but it, yeah. the, instead of it being a city, it's a sport. And it involves all of these men with egos. And one of the things that's so fascinating about the show and why it makes for great reality TV is each team is two guys on, on a team, but they're also competing against each other. And there's mm-hmm. obviously these deep-seated rivalries between teammates, not only between teams. And I, is there another sport that's like that where you're... Com- well, I mean, I guess... Yeah. So, so the reason, sport? no, no, there's not. But the reason it's so specific to Formula One, just so the listener knows, is that so every car is different, but teammates typically, um, unless something weird is going on, have the same exact car. Right. So you are judged against your teammate. And so in a weird way, even though they're, they're your quote unquote teammate, they are literally your only benchmark. Because that's the only person who has your car. And so if you consistently lose to your teammate, there is no excuse. If you consistently lose to Mercedes, you can go, well, Mercedes spends $500 million on their car, whatever, like w- w- nothing we could do about it. If you lose to the other Renault guy, you're screwed and you're a bad driver. So that's why yeah. tensions like are heightened within the teams. Yes, exactly. And so like, let's just go over some of the, the key people in, in okay. the Formula One world. So we were talking about Christian Horner. Yeah, and he's, who is the he's, team principal for Red Bull. Yeah, let's just call him the GM. We're Americans, okay? Okay. okay. He's, the, he's the GM of Red Bull, and he's married to a Spice Girl. How long have they been married? They got married in 2015, and okay, so it's so th- a fairly new thing. So she, she married into being Formula One royalty. That's correct. Which, by the way, I mean, like, as we said, like, if you're going to go visit him at work, it's in Monaco and Australia and all that stuff. So <laughs> it's a good... It's a good business to marry into. Very smart by her. Great job. So there's Christian. Is he, I got the feeling he's kind of nefarious, but also like really good at being on television. Like he says the right thing, which is like kind of provocative, but doesn't completely sell anyone out. Um, right. Is that well, a, a great moment is when, so just so everyone knows. So Daniel Ricardo last year was on Red Bull and in a, a huge plot line in season one is that he left the team after five years and left Max Verstappen, who was his teammate. And Horner would give these little lines, exactly what you're saying, which is like, he'd be super diplomatic. And then he'd be like, well, I think Daniel is running from a fight. You know, like those kind of things that can just drop in. And this year, the all time, this is kind of the Real Housewives thing. He said, Richardo. And then he was like, wait, is that how you pronounce his name? Which is just like, it seems (laughs) innocuous, but it's like, there's no way he worked with him for five years and didn't know how to pronounce his driver's name. I mean, he knows exactly. He mu- he and Jerry must watch reality television because he knows exactly what to say. Now, is he nefarious? I don't know. I mean, he also had the little uh, tiff with Cyril, the Renault head, last year when he stole Ricard- Ricardo. And uh, now I can't do it, um, Ricardo. <laughs> and so he knows exactly kind of what to do. That team is really good. I mean, Red Bull won championships at the beginning of the last decade. Um, the only problem with the Horner character is they're, they're like the third best team. And they, it's hard for them to close the gap on Mercedes. So it's a little bit hard for him to be like the boss of Formula One. But he's definitely got the personality for it. This is one of the reasons why I think the show is so great, though, and so great for the sport, is that Lewis Hamilton 
has a monopoly on Formula One, right? Like right. he's just the best. He's the driver for Mercedes. He's also by far the most famous. Like I knew who he was before the show. He's just by far, like he's like in the Daily Mail. None, none of the rest of them are. But the show adds so much color to the league yeah. and, and to people like me that there's other ways in. And I think that Daniel Ricardo is an absolute babe and would be a great bachelor. Seems like he's single. So and he, he has a home out here in Los Angeles. <laughs> I know. I, I was actually thinking that they that Australia and California sometimes look similar. Not all of Australia. I know it's a huge continent, country, whatever. Um, they look, kind of look similar. So you don't on his Instagram, you can't exactly tell where he is. Like, is he in Melbourne or is, is also he has a residence in Monaco, as all these guys do, which is so funny. He, he's also one of these guys who's on a GQ cover all the time, but in a different country that you didn't know how to right. GQ. He's always like, right. I'm in G- GQ Malaysia this week. And I was <laughs> like, that's amazing. Um, yeah. So Lewis Hamilton is the king. There's also, speaking of Netflix, a great David Letterman episode with Lewis where he details it because he's actually, and this shows up a couple times in the show, Lewis is one of the rare people who didn't grow with a ton of money. There are people, mo- most most people who are in Formula One, their parents grew up with at least a couple hundred millions of dollars or, or maybe you know tens of millions or whatever. Um, Lawrence Stroll, uh, who, or let's see, Lance, Lance Stroll was the child, Lance, he was the driver. Yeah. Um, his father uh, was an early fashion investor, I believe, like Tommy Hilfiger and those guys, made a couple hundred million dollars, if not billions, basically bought his son a team, that kind of thing. And so... It's it's that kind of thing, and Lewis Hamilton is not that. And he has an edge to him, but he's still a really nice person. I told you this story offline. I had a friend who ended up at a dinner with Lewis Hamilton at, at a fashion week, and at no point did Lewis say who he was or or a hint that he was a big deal, and people had to tell her afterwards who she just had dinner with. Like, So he just seems like a very... Uh, nice guy in the show. I, whether or not you know he is all the time, I don't know, but I, the, the reviews are good. The reviews are good. He seems like really like nice. Also, one thing that's very interesting about the sport that also is really good for the show is that there's a real kind of like upstairs, downstairs vibe to Formula One. There's like the mm-hmm. famous people, like the drivers and the principals, but then they interact with the engineers like a lot. And the engineers don't get to be named in the show as much, but they're a big part of it. And it's clear that if you really want to be good at Formula One, like you, like as a driver, you have to like work closely with your engineers and with the whole team that makes the car. It's really fascinating. There's just like so many, like, as you've been alluding to so many class dynamics at play. And it also is so dangerous. Like you're just like, you're watching these races and in season two, someone dies in in formula two. And And they, they capture that. It's, it's pretty wild. I I think the closest analog in the U S to this is probably something like hard knocks where the league buys into the show. Yeah. So I want to address two things there. Number one, is that Formula One as a sport is really fascinating because it's just pure competition and the small things. I mean, there's small things that create huge edges. It's almost like football in that regard, where if a team does one little thing, that could be their own between a Super Bowl and going eight and eight. And that could be something as small as having the wing be, you know, jut out half an inch or certain aerodynamic things or where where the feet are on the driving. There's actually an amazing book called uh, How to build a car by Christian yeah. Horner's right-hand man named Adrian Newey, who's the car designer at Red Bull. And he actually talks about all of the little differences that make uh, huge differences in the long run in Formula One. And it was, it was fascinating. If you want to dive in more, that's the thing. I do. Um, and a lot of yeah. a lot of it is like related to what motor you're using, what engine you're using. What engine and you're like using. Yeah. And dynamics. There's, and there's a lot of borrowing of engines. So there's some teams that borrow Ferrari's engine from the year before. Uh, like Red Bull does not make an engine. They have Honda make theirs. Um, and then... Big uh, plot couple, point. Yeah. And so, right, exactly. And so there's also, by the way, an Amazon documentary on McLaren from three years ago that involves Honda as well. Now, I saw this last March. NFL has its annual owners meeting in late March every year. So last year, I was all high on this show. And I had drinks with a couple of NFL executives. And I said, you got to watch this show because there's people I know who have bought into the sport because of this show. This was last year. I didn't even know you were going to become a Formula One super fan at this point. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> but I said this to them and I made the case and they were like, you know, a couple people had heard of it. A couple people had watched it. And they said that they're going to push for more access with teams, but NFL teams would just never give this up. The only thing they think they can do, and this is a little bit of a nugget because I don't think I've talked about this publicly. They think that at some point in the future, they'll be able to release all or nothing 
during the season. And it'll be like, okay, oh. they'll play on the, the, the blank team will play the Cowboys on Sunday. And then that, that episode will be out on Wednesday from the week before. But what essentially what the NFL equivalent of this would be, would be cameras on all 32 teams all the time. And right. then at the end of the season, produce the most compelling storylines. That's what's amazing. Like, I think that some of the tension there is so, you know, when Nico Hulkenberg from Renault was about to be dropped, I don't know if you've gotten to this episode, they had yeah. a guy in the car with him who was like, so are you think you're going to be dropped? And it was really uncomfortable, but, I'm, but it was just such great drama that I'm glad that I was there. Totally. I completely agree with you. There's also like a moment where the guy who's the head of Haas, his name's like something Steiner. G- Gunther or, Steiner. Yeah. Gunther Steiner. Who's, who's, a, who's a, br- a breakout star of both the first and the second season. Absolutely. Absolutely. He's just sort of like your generic European and, and he is phenomenal. Um, he's talking to a colleague and he's like, no, they'll cut it out. Don't worry. And then of yeah. course they didn't cut it out because we saw the show. I think that's, that's really helpful insight for understanding like what this would mean in like sports that I think most people are more familiar with. Cause it it is like shocking that they give so much access, particularly the drivers. I mean, the drivers are ultimate, ultimately have the most to lose, I think, because they are become the faces. And also if they talk badly about their current team, like, do you think Daniel Ricardo would have spoken poorly about Red Bull? Had he not already decided to leave? Yeah. I mean, that's a good question. I mean, Daniel Ricardo did say, we can just say this. He said the C word. He called Netflix the yes. C word on camera and he thought they were going to cut it out. And then he had to, he had to clarify that in Australia, that's kind of a, a term of endearment, which I think we're going to have to fact check that one. Yeah. Okay, t- Daniel Ricardo. I'm not totally sure. I mean, no, I mean, I think the psychology of it all and what they know and what they don't. And so in the last episode, they asked uh, Daniel Kayat, uh, who's, who's the Toro Rosso driver, um, they said, what's up with Netflix? And he said, I think they ignored me all season so they can F off. And like, I think that they, and he, he was right. They literally, that was the only thing they used of him the entire season. And he's like one of the 20 Formula One drivers. And so I think it's in their head that this is happening. And I think that they feel weird. Uh, Lance Stroll and his father, Lawrence Stroll, they weren't in this at all. And they were in season one. And so I'm sure they were a little bit hurt by that or they didn't want to be, you know, exposed as weird uh, billionaires who bought the team. But, but I'm glad they we're, weren't in it. They were boring. I think that I, it's only funny if if people are dunking on them for having bought a seat. But I don't yeah. know if if that could have happened the way the way we all wanted to. And so I think that the psychology is really weird. You know, if someone like Sebastian Vettel, who's won championships, he's got to deal with uh, Leclerc now, uh, Leclerc, and and sort of deal with the psychology of it all, but also in front of the cameras, which I'm sure is nerve wracking. And how do you present it? I, the the weirdest thing for me with Vettel and the Ferrari team. So Sebastian Vettel is essentially our age, Juliet. And he kept talking about music as if he was born in 1962. (laughs) He was like, I love eighties music. And then he was like, this is my jam. And then he started playing early nineties offspring. And I was like, what? I, I know that they Netflix was trying to hype up the age difference. If you want to downplay the age difference, my advice is to like get music from 2007, maybe and, not, not and 1993 offspring. The, the context is his, his um, teammate is Charles Leclerc, who is born in Monaco, which is yes. really, really unusual. Almost no one is born in Monaco. Yes. And he's like this up him and him and Max Verstappen are like the two upstarts who right. are like under 24 and threatening like this older generation. Lewis Hamilton going strong at 35. Love it, Lewis. He's um, so good. He's so good. It's it's really and exciting. And they have the but, best team. Right. One thing that's, I think, find it kind of interesting is I feel like it's also really good, like Mercedes propaganda. Because if you're like, huh, so I guess Mercedes is better than all the other cars. Maybe right. I should get one. It's obviously not the same as buying a Mercedes as like a regular person who drives around LA or whatever. But it is like effective marketing for all these brands. Like I never really think about Ferrari. I also like don't think about Tag Heuer that much, but now I have because right. they're on these Formula One cars and like on on their jumpsuits and everything. It's just yeah. like a really successful, effective show on so many levels. And I also think it's more more honest than a lot of docuseries. Like I think it's more honest than cheer. As a sport, Formula One is basically the sporting equivalent of the front of book of like GQ or like Mm -hmm. Esquire. It's just like, here's a watch and here's a nice vacation destination and here's a nice car. And now we're going to roll this out with people who are all handsome. 
right? And so, yes. And so I, what I've heard, I remember reading this a couple of years ago, but a team like BMW does not exist because of essentially what you're talking about, which is BMW, if they finished fifth, like we would all be like, oh man, BMW sucks compared to Mercedes. Yeah. And, and so right. it's a real risk if you're not Mercedes. And first of all, it takes hundreds of, and Mercedes has only been a team like that for about a decade. It's not like um, they, they've they they've made engines and, and were associated with a team called Braun before this and all that, but they weren't called, they weren't in its current form until about a decade ago. But it's a real risk for any car maker to come in because if you fail, you embarrass yourself and your car maker on a on a huge scale. I will say that they have a huge advantage. Mercedes and Ferrari and Honda uh, have a huge advantage just because they have a ton of of money to spend because that's what they do for a living. A team like Williams, right. which is run by Claire Williams, who's the um, uh, the the it's the, the family team, the, business, the Formula the family One business. It's a very interesting team, and there's also another Netflix documentary just about the Williams team. But um, they make their own stuff, and that's why they fail often, is they don't have $500 million just throw in an engine or, or aerodynamics or whatever. And so there's a lot of different wrinkles within it, and that's why it makes sports so fascinating. Kevin, thank you so much for joining me. I, I hope that everyone watches this show, and please report back on who your Formula One crush is. Mine is Juliet. Daniel Ricciardo. <laughs> oh, wait, what about Albin? I thought it was Albin. I just... Alex Alvin, I'm just excited about him. By the way, his mom went to prison for six years for yeah. fraud, and that's a plot point in the show. I'm just, I want to root for him, but I wouldn't say he's my Formula One crush. It's definitely so, Daniel Ricardo. <laughs> it, on Hollywood Boulevard in October, Ricardo and Albin and Verstappen and Valley Botas, I think that's it, just drove up and down and did wheelies or uh, like just spun out on Hollywood Boulevard for a while. And so now when they do it this fall, if they do it this fall after the pandemic is in, we can go, we can go together and we can have a great I time. I would love we that. Can see all your faves. <laughs> Kevin, thank you so much. I will uh, talk to you soon. Check out Kevin on the Ringer NFL show. If you haven't already, he's got all the latest on free agency and Tom Brady leaving the Patriots. All right. Thanks so much, Juliet. Thanks again to Kevin Clark and Rachel Lindsay. And remember, You Are Not Alone is a brand new novel of psychological suspense by the best-selling author pair behind the instant New York Times bestsellers, The Wife Between Us and An Anonymous Girl, Greer Hendricks and Sarah Pekinen. Need an escape and can't get enough of the drama on The Bachelor? Then read You Are Not Alone and find out why it's one of the most anticipated books of 2020. You Are Not Alone is on sale now wherever books are sold.